We humans, we tell stories. We tell stories to entertain. We tell stories to educate. We tell stories all the time. And stories fulfill important purposes in our society. Stories are the means by which we navigate the world. Stories help us to understand our infinitely complex environment. And the dominant stories of society even shape our future. And that means that if we change our story, we can change our future. And that is what I want to talk with you about today. And you know the fun thing about stories is that they're so powerful that you simply cannot not listen to them. So to kick off, I'd like to tell you a story. In this story, I take you back in time to Europe in the 1500s. And back in that time, religion had a major influence on the dominant culture and the way in which people understood the world they lived in. And although now unimaginable, one central aspect of this dominant story was the geocentric model of our planetary system, which said that the Earth was central in a planetary system and that the Sun, the Moon and all other planets orbited the Earth. And the church convincingly supported this idea, making that people held this to be the true model of our planetary system. Yet, in May 1543, in a small city of Frombourg, a new story emerged. A new mental model to understand our planetary system was proposed by a man named Nicolaus Copernicus. On his deathbed, he published a revolutionary work in which he proved his heliocentric model, which described that it's not the Earth that is central in our planetary system, but it's the Sun. It was a radical publication that marked the start of the Copernican Revolution. In the decades to come, Copernicus's heliocentric model replaced the geocentric model and has since been the dominant way of understanding our planetary system. So with his publication in 1543, Nicolaus Copernicus changed the story and changed the future. And now, more than 400 years later, our environmental issues call for a new Copernican revolution, a new far-reaching change in how we understand our environment and our impact upon it. We need to change the story to change the future. But first, back to Copernicus. Because the Copernican Revolution initiated a cascade of developments that brought us into a new age. And in this new age, which we now know as the age of reason, it wasn't religion anymore that governed our worldview, but rather science. And fueled by science, mankind profoundly changed its view on nature. For long, nature was seen as unknowable, mystified and subsuming the human endeavor. Yet, in the age of reason, we increased our understanding of nature. Through the execution of scientific experiments, we better understood and we unraveled the mysteries of our natural phenomena. And the more we were able to understand our nature, the better we were able to control it and to use it in our favor. And this perceived ability to control our environment marked the start of a new story of society. A new story in which mankind saw oneself no longer as part of the environment, but as separate and superior to our ecosystem. And inspired by this story of superiority over our ecosystem, we waged our war in nature and conquered it. Starting an industrial revolution at exponentially increasing rates, we made nature servant to our needs. We transformed massive areas of land into farmland for food production. We started the exploitation of the Earth's fossil resources. And powered by the steam engine, we developed a majestic global economy. And besides these manifestations, also our cultural values started to reflect our presumed dominance over nature. Over time, we didn't account for our planetary boundaries anymore as we started to expect infinite economic growth on a finite planet, as we started to consume more than our Earth could provide us with. We've built our modern civilization on the conviction that we could be separate and superior to nature. However, the longer we live this story of dominance over nature, the more fractures we started to see with it. And our current environmental issue demonstrates that we cannot just endlessly subject our world to satisfying our human needs. Surely, but slowly, we've come to realize that we're not superior over nature, but rather 
highly dependent on it. We've come to realize the failure of the story that has dominated since the age of reason. And this is where it becomes critical. Because we collectively recognize that this story leads us to push past the planetary boundaries and cause severe climate change. We all know about the melting ice caps. We all know about the Amazon that's on fire, about a declining biodiversity. But let me ask you this. What have we done so far about our climate change? As a response to climate change, we haven't changed the dominant story of society. No. As a response, we've developed ever more complex technologies and products to uphold the story that led us to push past our planetary boundaries in the first place. Instead of structurally reducing the amount of fossil fuels that were burned, we now try to capture the carbon emissions at the end of our fossil power plants. Instead of lowering our demands and consuming a bit less, we now compensate the negative impacts of our airline tickets so that we can still continue to consume. And that is problematic. Now, don't get me wrong, yeah? because the development of these sustainable technologies does contribute to reducing our environmental impact, but only reduces the velocity at which we're approaching our environmental crisis. It doesn't change course. It's what Einstein famously said, we cannot solve a problem with the same mindset with which we created it. As long as we continue to see ourselves as superior over our planet, as long as we continue to demand more than our Earth can provide us with, we will inevitably push past multiple of our planetary boundaries. If it's not the excessive emissions of greenhouse gases, we will, fueled by our greed, push through other planetary boundaries, such as shortages of fresh water or a loss of fertile topsoil to, fo to grow our food. It's like we're like a jobless man who on the one hand tries really hard to pay off one of his loans at a bank, while at the same time he starts two new ones because he wants to continue to drive his sports car. We can't have our cake and eat it too. Society can only fully address the full scope of its environmental challenges when respect for our planetary boundaries is reflected in our most fundamental values about who we are and how we should live. Anything short of changing our beliefs falls short of addressing the full scope of our environmental issue. So building a livable world in which we can satisfy the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs requires us to change our most fundamental values. It requires us to change our hidden beliefs. It requires us to change the story to change the future. So we need a new story that helps us to fashion an effective response to the complex issue of climate change. And we at the Youth Climate Movement in the Netherlands, we've made a start with this new story of society. In our Youth Climate Agenda, we've united the vision of over 100,000 students, youngsters and young professionals about their ideal sustainable future in 2050. And the essence of the story is that we undergo a second Copernican revolution. Where the first Copernican revolution created a shift from a geocentric to a heliocentric view on our planetary system. In our second Copernican revolution, we move from an egocentric to an ecocentric view on our planet. We move away from the egocentric idea that mankind is central in nature and that nature can and should be controlled in pursuit of our personal gains. Instead, we take an ecocentric approach, which really acknowledge our dependence on an ecosystem. We recognize ourselves as a guest on our planet and our planetary boundaries as the cornerstone of our existence. And in our youth climate agenda, we describe how we ideally live, work, travel, eat and learn in 2050, all with respect to this ecocentric model. And let me give you an idea of what we've written down. Because in 2050, we'll focus on collective well-being on the long term, instead of individual wealth of, on the short term. We'll discover that the virtues of thrift, modesty and frugality will have come back into vogue, leading us to measure our, uh, measure our self worth not by the material goods that we possess, but by our character. And the motivations of greed, envy and lust will have been replaced by a genuine sense of sufficiency to know when we have enough for our collective well-being. 
And based on this, we develop a global responsibility as we recognize that our local actions have global consequences. And these values come to life in our thriving societal systems. In 2050, we have food systems that are circular, transparent, and local. We have a thriving sharing economy in which we not only share our electric vehicles and our tools, but even our living spaces. And given the universal recognition of our dependence on the ecosystem, we re reconnect with nature. We, in our free time, engage in ecotourism. We grow food on rooftops and in cities. And we educate our kids in food forests. And these are just some of this, the aspects of this new story of society. And you know there are so many benefits to developing such a new story. Because firstly, if you develop such a sh new shared story of society, it helps to unite people behind a joint definition of what constitutes a good life on this planet. And this helps to get rid of the polarization that we're now all experiencing in the climate change debate. And secondly, by starting from this new story of society, this vision for the future, and translating that back to policy measures in the present, we can come to much more effective policy measures. Let me give you an example for that. In the Netherlands, we want to make a transition towards more sustainable personal transport. So the Dutch government came with the obvious solution to bring about 2 million electric cars on the road by 2030. Quite a good idea, right? Research, however, showed that there would not be sufficient earth metals available to provide for these electric cars for 2030. So seemingly, the limited availability of earth metals it holds us from the transition towards electric and sustainable transport. However, if you ask students and youngsters, if you start from this new story of society and translate it back to the present, then there's not a problem at all. Because the youngsters that we've spoken say that they much rather have shared electric vehicles rather than possessing their own electric cars. And with shared electric mobility, you can use your cars much more efficiently, meaning that you need a lot fewer vehicles and thus a lot fewer resources. And then all of a sudden this issue is not an issue anymore. So navigating the future on the basis of such a new story of society helps us to understand the environmental issue that we're in. It helps us to fashion effective responses to the complex issue of climate change. And it unites us behind a joint definition of what constitutes a good life on this planet. 477 years after Nikolaus Copernicus changed the story and changed his future with the first Copernican revolution. Our environmental issues call for a new Copernican revolution, one in which we move from an egocentric to an ecocentric view on our planet, in which we recognize ourselves as a guest on our planet and our valuable planetary boundaries as the cornerstone of our existence so that we can build a livable world in which we not only satisfy the needs of the present, but also satisfy those of the future generations. So that hopefully, my kids will wonder what that sustainable development was that daddy worked so hard for, as the only development that they know is per definition sustainable. So let's change our story to change our future. Thank you very much.